All right. Widely credited as one of the greatest shows of all time, The Wire debuted in 2002 and portrayed the lives, crimes, and systemic abuses of major institutions at play within a major American city, Baltimore, Maryland. Some pricks might even call it Dickensian. Dickensian. It's got writing described as literary. Oh, indeed. A talented, now extremely recognizable cast that deals with complicated issues portrayed in nuanced ways, and even though it never fared well at the Emmys, when we look back at its run of over 60 episodes in five seasons, we see how The Wire has held up remarkably well, feeling as relevant as ever, even if the scenes where they marvel at cell phones are hilarious in hindsight. Probably sending a text message. My kids are crazy over that. During its runtime, though, television would see large shifts in perception. The Wire was an HBO show and carried the weight of that label as it premiered just three years into The Sopranos, what many consider is the origin of the prestige drama. You know the prestige drama I'm talking about. You know, the one where a flawed, morally ambiguous white dude has a story of success and a skewed facsimile of the American dream. You know, where, you know, where they navigate like a personal health concern and lies that threaten to tear apart the fragile excuses they hold up for their families. You know the one I'm talking about. Please don't hate me, I love those shows. Now, The Wire gets lumped in on paper, but with an ensemble cast and the central thesis being expressed over multiple seasons, its execution, aesthetics, and direction separate it from other prestige drama ranks of noted anti-hero centric shows like Mad Men, Breaking Bad, and the aforementioned Sopranos. In contrast to others, The Wire tells the story of Baltimore and its people, those with power and without, and how the fecal law of gravity cannot be escaped because the shit always rolls downhill. So settle in, get cozy. I'm Dennis from That's For The Birds, and this is a look back at one of my favorite shows, The Wire. <laughs> Written and created as a collaborative effort between David Simon, a 13-year journalist for the Baltimore Sun, and Ed Burns, police-turned-teacher. Developing a secret working relationship within that capacity, they eventually linked up for The Corner before honing their vision with The Wire. Simon's idea for the show started out loosely based on police drama experiences of his writing partner Burns. Simon has said that despite its framing as a crime drama, though, the show is, quote, really about the American city and about how we live together. It's a story about how institutions have an effect on individuals, whether one is a cop, a longshoreman, a drug dealer, a politician, a judge, or a lawyer. All are ultimately compromised and must contend with whichever institution to which they're committed. But is it copaganda? Yeah. But we'll get into that. Quick spoiler-free elevator pitch. Set over five seasons, most episodes are seen through the lens of a police unit and the criminal enterprises they hunt. The Wire tells the perspectives of both the police and their targets, but also the people who influence and live in their world. Politicians, the media, drug addicts, and everyday citizen. Each season focuses on broadening the scope of the story, but much like Plato's allegory of the cave, as we pull back, more becomes clear about the nature of the world. By the end, each season feels like a natural progression on the journey from the corner to City Hall. Each one an example, argument, or condemnation of the various entities at play within the framework of a major American city, with a high crime rate, a redlined population, and the slow hammer of gentrification and decay beating down daily. The show is stacked in so many ways, if it were an RPG character, it'd have an insane stat distribution. I'm talking nines and tens, baby, whether it's the writing and dialogue, characters and world, set design and location, or just the directing, editing, and sound design. Nothing about this show feels unintentional. You'll come to know streets like Lexington and Fulton, areas of Baltimore like The Towers, Pimlico, or Poplar Grove. You'll realize you've built a small dictionary of phrases, both local and contextual, from hoppers to knockos. Bit by bit, you'll piece together the city and its inhabitants and come to understand them both intimately. For those who haven't seen it, go watch it. It's worth experiencing fresh, and my video will be here when you get back, but hey, Maybe leave a like and a comment. Tell me you appreciate the heads up. My dogs sure do appreciate it as each like translates to one pat for each and they're currently terminally ill from Nita Petalatus. Do your part. You should all know also that this show feels tailor-made to my interests. I graduated with a degree in sociology with a focus on criminology and corrections. This show is basically a bingo card of topics I find fascinating from the war on drugs to recidivism and here it's handled in a way that does justice to the nuances of what it's portraying, most of the time. And second disclaimer, I am a white man, so 
I'll do my best to speak from my perspective and not for different groups or people, but I'm open to criticism where I might not have the right lens to view these complex issues. So we're talking about every season of The Wire, characters, plot, overarching themes in detail. So from here on out, it's all spoilers, but we're on the same page, right? Oh, no doubt. When you walk through the garden, you gotta watch your back. Boom! First sidebar. Sorry, I know this is super early, but she. This OP is an absolute banger. It's just one of those unskippable intros that worms its way into your brain as soon as you hear it and stays with you as you cruise through episodes. Each season provides new visuals and renditions set with the current plot. The song itself is thematically relevant to the nature of the show and the characters that live in it, but beyond that, just damn dude, what a tune, am I right? All right. Talking about The Wire is impossible without talking about its characters, both relatable and outlandish with some of the smoothest dialogue and interactions you can capture on television. Something about the prose and cadence of the actor is both native to Baltimore and from across the world, to mix my metaphors, melts like butter in your ears. The sounds of the city and environments are all believable and help to immerse you in every scene because they were there in the streets of Baltimore, in its homes, its schools, and offices, and more. Many of the show's actors would tell you that the most important character in The Wire was Baltimore itself, a city brought to life with all its complexities and problems. With cast chemistry being important and authenticity being vital, the creators along with casting director Alexa Fogel and producer Nina Noble knew they needed to find the perfect people to fill those roles, with some being one and done and others doing multiple roles until the time came along for the right fit. Moreover, those roles are written with care by Simon and Burns, which makes it difficult to place any specific character on the spectrum of good to bad, just a whole lot of gray, though some are easier to place than others. Starting with the primary players and working outward can be difficult because describing the protagonist and antagonist is a struggle of its own. If the definition of a protagonist is the leading character or one of the major characters in a drama, who could be the protagonist here? Is it who we spend the most time with, who we care for the most, or who puts the events in motion? For The Wire, many of these questions are multifaceted. They create fans who want to see the cops get the guy, and to see those same guys get away. We don't linger exclusively, though, on the parallels of systemic institutions. We dive deep into the interpersonal relationships with those at play within them. Through time, we see patterns that repeat on a micro level, which suggests something about the larger system at work that inevitably creates these players, like a Batman supervillain riddle of sorts. The wire blurs the line between protagonist and antagonist in a way that can only be resolved by understanding that the series' foundation is built on its persistent challenges of a world where distinctions between good and evil and crime and punishment are difficult to parse, or in other words, they're just people living in a... Say the line, Bart! Society. Yay! What I can say is that each season has a core theme, and the characters, as well as their parts in the show, help to reinforce and reflect those themes. In season one, we meet the core cast that will follow for the bulk of the show's run. This list is going to steadily grow and change as people come in and out of the show. I might leave some out in service of just not being here all day, but just know that even small characters end up playing notable parts in the series, and there's a lot of them, so bear with me. There's Jimmy McNulty, played by Dominic West, one of multiple notable British actors showing their range with impressive accents and American performances. Jimmy is natural police, encompassing all the complexity that loaded phrase has to offer. What the fuck did I do? A complex mix of ego, intelligence, and obsession. Sprinkle in some alcoholism and workaholism and you've got McNulty. A headache to his superiors, a scoundrel to his colleagues, an arrogant adulterer. And he's without a doubt the most swollen asshole in American law enforcement. <laughs> Funk Moreland, played by Wendell Pierce, the first secured role in the team and a central force through the show's run. Similarly to Jimmy, he has a propensity to give a shit when it isn't his turn, and this can cause more work for him that he begrudgingly accepts. Due to the nature of the relationship between Jimmy and Bunk being central on the show, chemistry was incredibly important, and from their first read-through, Wendell Pierce said he knew they'd found their guy. Shakima Kima Greggs, played by Sonia Son, is competent at her job and her desire to live up to the ideal she believes police should strive for. 
Kima would portray one of the several homosexual primary characters, something addressed early and thankfully the show had the grace to treat Kima like her whole personality and purpose wasn't to be tokenized for that aspect. Instead, she becomes a realistic portrayal along with a complex character who develops over the course of the show. Ellis Carver, played by Seth Gilliam, originally auditioned for the role of Stringer Bell. While seen early as part of a dysfunctional duo, Carver would be another in a line of well-developed characters, afforded a journey of self-discovery over the course of the show's run. He becomes an example of the kind of mental change required to properly address the failures of the way police operate in communities. Thomas Herc Hulk, played by Dominic Lombardozzi, a complex character who represents the yin to Carver's yang. Early on, they're of a similar mind, busting heads in the Western District way and resentful for their perceived status within their unit. Though, through Dominic's portrayal of Herc, we see the cost of self-indulgence and the lack of flexibility to adapt to a changing landscape of what policing could be, preferring instead to double down on aggressive and self-serving ways. The effects of his choices create a domino effect in the final seasons that truly highlight many of the inadequacies of the system. Roland Prez Prezbaluski, played by Jim True Frost, initially seen as incompetent and rash, he proves to function better behind the scenes as a talented code cracker. Our first experience with him in a later assault on a teenager paints a picture of arrogance and entitlement we find out is partly at least a symptom of his nepotism. He grows up to one of the more well-rounded roles though in the series. Detective Lester Freeman, played by Clark Peters, brings big dad energy to the team. With a smooth line and stern look, in the words of Lieutenant Daniels, I'm the father you never had, and I don't want to be disappointed in you ever again. Turns out Lester's been sitting on the shelf for a while. Thirteen years and four months. Thirteen years. And four months. Because like McNulty, he has a habit of crossing the wrong people while sticking to his principles. He doesn't resent it though, knowing he made a personal decision to land him there. And once he gets the chance to pursue real cases again, he comes out of his corner and puts his skin back in the game. Rhonda Perlman, played by Deirdre Lovejoy, who works closely with the police department as they get on the same page for investigations they take part in. Rhonda would be something of a neutral force during the series as the resident lawyer, pressed into uncomfortable situations as a result of the major crime unit's actions. She has ladder climbing aspirations that mirror Lieutenant Daniels pretty well though, and much of her journey focuses on navigating those aspirations. She's one of our main perspectives into the judicial system. Lieutenant Cedric Daniels is played by legendary actor Lance Reddick, a real-life Baltimore native and Yale graduate known for a wide range of roles on TV like The Wire or Fringe to movies like John Wick and even iconic video game characters like Zavala from Destiny and Silence from Horizon Zero Dawn. With one of the smoothest voices in the game and a piercing gaze that stares through your soul, Daniels that we meet is on his quest up the company ladder as well. Initially, he sets off to give the bosses exactly what they want, but his growth from a hard ass with a shady past to his final form is one I've really grown to love over time. Arguably, the show's biggest antagonists are the police command, which tracks but they provide a framework within the police that highlights the failures of political intervention and chasing results to appease the people who promote you. Deputy of Operations Bill Rawls, played by John Doman, a career-minded, stat-driven asshole with teeth, he has a penchant for intimidation and denigration. He's often referred to as the last person you'd want to cross, and he lives up to the reputation. Through his time on the series, we see someone singularly focused on control and the accumulation of power. There's Deputy Commissioner Irvin Burrell, played by Frankie Faison, a careerist who cares more about reducing crime on paper than any strong case. His struggles as a police commissioner often serve to highlight the inadequacies of career chasing, but his proficiency at gaining leverage to stay in the game highlights his defining trait as a perpetual survivor. Moving into the drug trade, though, we have several players on both sides of the selling and buying. There's Avon Barksdale, played by Wood Harris, D'Angelo's uncle and the head of the Baltimore drug trade on the west side. He's intelligent and intimidating, and he exudes an air of a man in charge. Wood Harris puts in a fan-favorite performance that captures the evolution of his presence from a mystery man to the police, to a more active player within the story and even later on within the machinations of the drug game within prison. There's the intensely charismatic Russell Stringer Bell, played by Idris Elba, two for two on our friends across the pond, here seen early in his career as well, Idris would arguably rise to the cast's greatest heights. With a deep voice and a calculating demeanor, Stringer Bell screams competence and control. I am aware of the effect I have on women. Cool little details like his ability to draw and his suppressed expression while manipulating witnesses on the stand in the series' opening court case lend a sense of skill and dexterity to his very presence. 
There's D'Angelo Barksdale, played by Larry Gilliard Jr. Much of his early journey focuses on making sense of his place in the game and whether violence needs to play a part in it at all. Despite his introduction being through this trial for murder, a murder we know he's committed, Larry's portrayal went on to endear D'Angelo to the audience and became another fan favorite character, a true example of how perspective and empathy can lead us to care for people in and out of the drug world. Proposition Joe, played by Robert F. Chu, is another real-life Baltimore local on the cast, and he plays a primary rival to the Barksdale crew as head of the East Baltimore drug trade. Prop Joe's smooth-talking, wheeling, and dealing nature would set him up as a cerebral counterpart to the more physical Avon. If the Barksdales and Prop Joe represent the drug dealers of the story, who's our avenue to the other side of the game? Reginald Bubbles' cousins, played by Andre Royo, is an emotional anchor to the show expertly portraying addiction and its effects on himself and his relationship with his family. His storyline is praised for providing perspective of those without homes and how larger systems at play within the city leads to mass suffering from the war on drugs as well as the challenges of addiction on an individual level. The mainest man Bubbles is given arguably the most time and care in developing into his final form because so much of his experience highlights an important part of those living without homes or struggling with substance abuse. It isn't a lack of intelligence or motivation that keeps these people in these circumstances. Even the creative and driven can fall victim to the punishing drug trade and the ineffective war on it. Relating to Bubbles in many ways as a victim of the game is Wallace, played by Michael B. Jordan, a 15-year-old drug dealer working in a low-rise pit for the Barksdale organization. Michael B. Jordan would grow up and take the world by storm, but here he's understated and expertly navigates the complex nature of a boy with a half-finished education thrust into the world he ultimately can't extricate himself from. He shows intelligence in some ways and a curiosity to learn things like chess or new perspectives for how to handle the game from D'Angelo. But at the same time, he struggles with quick math and the intense posturing and focus required of people within the drug world. Ultimately. His naive actions result in the brutal torture and death of a Barksdale enemy, and though he's intercepted by the police, in the end he's left to slip through the cracks and dies, setting a tone for the series and marking an ideological change in D'Angelo. His death served as an early reminder that the cost of entry in this world is high, and some have no choice in the matter due to socioeconomic situations. Finally, we meet one of the most iconic characters in modern television, Omar Little. Omar the Terror. Been ripping and bobbing out here for years now. Played by Michael K. Williams, Omar would make waves as an anti-hero of a different sort within the framework of The Wire. Inspired aesthetically by long, trench coat wearing cowboy badasses of David Simon's youth, along with personal flares by Michael K. like the whistle and the shotgun. Omar is the kind of man who'd never put his gun on a citizen because a man's got to have a coat. He operates with a set of ethics and rules that allow him to use his status and reputation in lieu of violence at times. What stands out most as a result of his code is his compassion. A loving man to his family and partners in crime, another example of a nuanced portrayal of homosexuality in The Wire, and in a broader way, masculinity. It's hard to argue that he doesn't emulate traditional badass masculine elements while being uncharacteristically kind and compassionate for a man of his vocation. His disdain for profanity, his tender touch for his boyfriend, and the resulting tragic pain that stems from his loss. All this lends weight to the special nature of his place within the story. He's related to infamous in-world Baltimore legends like Nohard Anthony, and he wields a mythological reputation of his own. He plagues the Baltimore drug trade in a way that supersedes violence at times. To Omar, it isn't what you're taking, it's who you're taking it from. You feel me? No doubt. Omar is based on real-life figure Donnie Andrews, a robber famous for a code of ethics on the streets of Baltimore, which speaks to the heart of the show's authentic feel. Some characters were based on real people the creators met through their time working in Baltimore, and in some cases, those real people even became staples of the show. Aided by the use of residents as extras, which allowed the experience to feel as authentic to Baltimore as possible, as well as extending that past the extras into other more prominent roles.
There's Felicia Snoop Pearson, who was literally found by Michael K. Williams in a club in Baltimore, fresh out of jail, and like so many, had gone right back into the game. Michael fought for her to be a part of the show, and she became a mainstay, bringing genuine authenticity to the role. There's Jay Landsman, played by Delaney Williams, but that was auditionally auditioned for by Jay Landsman. Apparently, he wasn't Landsman enough for the role. Uh, luckily, the real Landsman does get to stand up later on. Wow, that's a lot of lands, man. There's Ed Norris, played by Ed Norris, a real-life former police commissioner and executive producer for the show at times. Even a prolific narcotics trafficker investigated by Ed Burns himself. The Deacon, played by little Melvin Williams, who served as the inspiration for Avon Barksdale. How is it you got so much wisdom about who should be where? A good church man is always up in everybody's shit. He's one of my favorites. The Wire also shows that, despite the very Baltimore things that make this experience what it is, shaking it, jiggle it, these events and systems could take place in any city. They brush up against Philly or New York, but these same issues are at play there, and many people in places all over the world will see reflections of their own experiences laid bare here. This great tapestry, this great narrative of social issues that is wrong, things that are wrong in our country, not just in the black community, just not just a Baltimore story. This is going on in every hood, in every city, in every state around these United States. Season one's main conflict is at its core, the result of one annoying person's personal ego, a chip on McNulty's shoulder. Upset over the indifference to the violence that perpetrated by the West Baltimore drug trade and assured in his conviction as one of the only police officers worth a damn. He goes behind his department's back to a judge who applies political pressure to get a unit created to investigate the Barksdales. We meet our core cast and many side characters during the creation of the unit and its process at fighting internal pushback to expand the investigation beyond street busts. Through season one, we see violence and intelligence at play from the perspectives of both the police unit and the Barksdale crew. Season one is viewed as sort of a series primer, almost like a necessary appetizer to understand the main course. Early on, terms like Title III wiretaps or DNRs are tossed out like a rock in a pond, explained in detail so that later seasons can pursue the ripples that result from looking into the processes. We learn early on, as Freeman puts it, All the pieces matter. Through the first season, we see the structure and organization of the Barksdales and the efforts they go through to hide their activities, as well as the methods the police use to intercept and understand their plans. Omar Little is introduced as a foil to both the police and the drug dealers as a chaotic element, ripping off a stash in his first appearance, which leads to the police raiding an empty stash house, wasting police dollars. When his lover's killed, he sets out on a personal crusade to make the Barksdales pay, going as far as to work with the police as an informant, a thread planted like a seed that'll see fruition in the next season. Through Bubbles' help as an informant and the use of the wire, they slowly nail down various front organizations and get a handle for the way the organization moves massive amounts of drugs through Baltimore, eventually uncovering a main stash. But Kima is shot while attempting an undercover buy, leading to a push from the mayor and higher-ups to get dope on the table. Dope on the table. Regardless of the effects it may have on their larger investigation, and this shows a symptom of a larger problem explored in detail throughout the wire the political mismanagement of their forces. Wallace is flipped and then killed, taken off the board as a potential witness. D'Angelo is caught with a massive quantity of drugs and as a result of the wire, when he learns that Wallace is killed by Stringer Bell, he almost turns on the organization, taking down his uncle and mother along with it. D'Angelo, shut your mouth. Where's Wallace? That's all I wanna know. Look at me! Look at me! Where the fuck is Wallace? Huh? In the end, though, D'Angelo is coerced into staying loyal by his mother, leaving the police with little to charge. They settle for 20 years on D'Angelo and a light seven for Avon, with Stringer Bell going free. This bittersweet ending to season one is representative of most seasons of The Wire. We see the difficult interactions that occur from a system rife with both personal incompetence and systemic motivations to obscure issues. Thematically, this season seeks to portray the hierarchical structures that apply influence on the drug trade from the corners all the way up to City Hall. McNulty involves a judge who's new to his powerful role and willing to throw his weight around. 
Eventually though, due to being politically isolated, he too begins to give up on the purpose behind the case, eventually bowing to that same political pressure and leaving Jimmy out to dry. Season 1 says a lot about the police, political, and criminal systems within Baltimore and the parts that push and pull each other. It aims to show the from the very first episode you beat on the right people and the shit rolls down the hell and leads to ineffectual investigations from the police, fatal efforts from the police, and fatal efforts from criminals they chase in reaction to those elements at play. During season one, an incredible dance is performed by the writers as they juggle these characters and themes while conveying motivations and setting up conflicts in as efficient a way as possible, pacing out each section so they breathe with no point feeling rushed to or from. We meet the bulk of the first season's major players within the first two episodes, and characterization is provided for them in quick fashion. McNulty's arrogance and narcissism, Bunk's propensity to pick up the phone and give a shit when it isn't his turn, Herc's resentment at being ordered by his peers, Carver's willingness to go along with what's asked of him no matter what, Kima's competence and her acute understanding of the importance of a good CI, or Daniel's company man mentality and Rhonda's no-nonsense approach to handling her colleagues. Not to mention the instant threat posed by Avon and Stringer Bell, as well as a brimming sense of disillusionment from D'Angelo. Our major players are given just enough time to stick in our brains before we begin piling more people into the ride. Season 1 was critically praised and received high ratings and scores from fans and critics alike, seen as an incredibly realistic and earnest take on the problems that plague major cities all over the country exuding an air of authenticity and generating buzz over fan-favorite characters from all walks of life, it was easy to fall in love with The Wire, despite its heavy themes, or maybe because of them. You gotta keep the devil down in the hole. For season two, though, few fans would be prepared for the shift on the horizon. In fact, even actors within the show were not on board for the show's direction in season two. A notable change from season one is the introduction of a brand new set of characters of, let's say, a lighter color palette. Put bluntly, the reception to the switch from what was perceived as a predominantly black story beloved by those communities to a story whose scope would expand to the docks worked by mostly white Polish longshoremen was mixed. I was happy and um, we had season one in the can and I just knew that this was a black thing. Like, you know, we made it, we got a good black TV show. And then here come David Simon with his beautiful, crazy, twisted mind. He threw us into um, season two. I remember going to him saying, you know, so so why is it that every time black people make something hot, you take it and then you're going to turn this into a white show? What, what's, what's up with that? And he says, you know what, Michael? He said, if we went right back to the projects and to the, to the corners in season two, he said, it would make your world seem extremely small. Said, Trust me, I got I got you. I started to realize that, oh, this is not about me. This is not, it's not about my career, how much screen time I thought I should have gotten, or you know, what I thought the world should do, how I thought the show should go. It had nothing to do with me. And in fact, it had everything to do with it. I was just a small part of something great. Time, however, has been kind to season two. In many ways, the second season of The Wire cements its themes central to its entire run. It shows that while these systems of control aren't exclusive to race, they very much disproportionately affect them and simultaneously fall along class lines. It shows that there can be solidarity in the face of institutions that exist in any community. This one just happens to take place in a city that's over 60% black. As Ta-Nehisi Quotes said, I can't believe I said Ta-Nehisi Quotes. Oh no. <laughs> or as Ta-Nehisi Coates said, This is what people forget. Season one, you get drugs in Baltimore and you get the image of these black drug dealers is well within the, the imagination. It's done really, really well. That's not a shot at it. Season two, he's like, oh, you thought this was some black shit? No, it's not. It's yeah, not. I mean, it just, this way. And quietly, it just flips. This is, no, 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 this is, this is Baltimore, man. And as a person that grew up in Baltimore, I knew they were poor white people in Baltimore. I knew they were working class white people who had these problems. You didn't, you know, see them in the same way. But to say, no, no, this ain't just black folks. This is the system at large, and it's eating at everything. Without season two of The Wire, David Simon felt that people wouldn't grasp the pervasive nature of the systems that affect people across cultural and racial lines. That season two would be necessary to lay down the foundation that perspective and understanding could be built on. 
though by broadening the scope, the show's narrative complexity also increases. This initial hurdle, along with the show resisting the urge to get the band back together, keeps McNulty separated as a result from his actions from last season. Eventually, though, all roads lead back to a new investigative unit. Somehow, once again, brought together by ego and political pressure. What a surprise. This time, they really outdid themselves on the bullshit, though. Season 2 begins with a now honed deficiency. They introduce and reintroduce many of the season's main players with care and quick characterization. To start, several characters are dealing with the consequences of their actions. McNulty rides the boat as a punishment for stirring shit up. Daniels is in the basement doing evidence control with a law degree, contemplating retirement at this point. Bunk is still in homicide tracking down witnesses on last season's open thread involving Omar Little and his willingness to take the stand as a witness against the Barksdales. Kima's riding the desk as a promise to her girlfriend after taking a bullet in the line of duty, and Carver is now promoted as a result of his rat behavior for Burrell. He works as a sergeant out of the Southeast District. It turns out that him unexpectedly leaping Hark for Sergeant last season was due in part to his betrayal. Prez feels lost as his career is mapped out against his will by his father-in-law, Major Stan Valchek, played by Al Brown, a Polish cop both petty and privileged with the political connections and will to get his way. In season one, he's briefly seen coercing support from Daniels after Prez assaults a young hopper. He represents the pure ego and political weight that turns people into pieces of leverage. We meet B.D. Russell, played by actress Amy Ryan, who becomes involved in the unit after discovering a shipping can filled with trafficked women, who died on the passage and are being discarded by the police who all fight to get out of jurisdictional responsibility for the crime. If they were alive, they'd be illegals, and that would mean immigration. But they're dead, so they're cargo. Cargo, but no contraband. There's nothing here to be seized as a customs violation. Through B.D., we get a fish-out-of-water character whose job patrolling the docks never led to something like this, Starting off green, she quickly gains a unique skill set though, and with the special unit, along with some great one-liners, she gets to react with incredulity to some of the backward laws they encounter. You mean you can tap a guy's phone if he's selling drugs, but if he's selling women, he's out of bounds? That's the law. That's the law. FBI agent Terry Fitz Fitzhugh, played by Doug O'Lear, returns in a more substantive role this season, being brought into the special unit's investigation of the dock's smuggling operations, only involved with a mandate to pursue union corruption. Ignoring the bodies, though, they bring with them an insane level of manpower and funding compared to the BPD. His very presence is another example of how funds and forces are misappropriated due to the whims of political powers. We'll see a familiar face in Bodie Broadus, played by J.D. Williams, a character that's easy to hate and hard to hate all at once. He's the man who killed Wallace on Stringer Bell's orders, but he's obviously also a product of the various institutions at play within the city. His mother is swallowed up by the drug trade. His brother was murdered at a young age. He idolizes the lifestyle that seeks to be respected within the rules of the game that he understands as fact. Initially a low-level drug dealer, he grows within the organization and matures throughout the series as his perspective is molded by his experience as a soldier of the game, eventually discarded. It's here, though, that we see the first significant shift as we briefly meet a group of Polish dock workers with apparent authority arguing with a group of black dock workers setting up the nuanced dynamic of the groups within Locust Point. A primary focus for the entirety of Season 2 is how the docks and the people that work or live there are beholden to the same systems as the drug dealer in the pits or the lawyer in the courts. It shows how federal systems with political motivations can be tools to bust unions under the pretense of tackling drug problems. Frank Sabatka, played by Chris Bauer, is a man carrying the weight of his union on his back. As a leader, he's in charge of checking the cans at the docks, and with his ability, comes along with European connections that facilitates the smuggling of narcotics, products, and even women into Baltimore. It's clear, though, when a can of women turn up dead that he can't or didn't know the range of his actions. Rather, he didn't want to know, so he avoided them. Much of his journey resolves around the desire to save the decaying life his family has worked on generationally, that the docks are slowly dying as a victim of gentrification and innovation, and land and livelihood are being taken from them bit by bit. Nicholas Sabaka is played by Pablo Schreiber, and in his schemes, Nick plays an altogether sympathetic character who balances a lack of work with his slow descent into the game as a means to provide a leg up for his family. That's not to say he's perfect. 
He's a deeply flawed man who pushes a back against any implication of homosexuality as a personal affront. You want a streak or something? You could put a little purple in it. Yeah, and right after that, I'll just go ahead and stick my tongue up some guy's ass. His posturing feels reminiscent of the corner boys we meet in season one. Whoa! Another sidebar here. See, this is what people mean when they talk about toxic masculinity. It's... Not an idea that all forms of masculinity are toxic, but that certain societal expectations have led to toxic behaviors ingrained in a way that the worst aspects of society often are. It creates a false sense of masculinity when pushing back against any perceived weakness they associate with it, or denigrating people like, say, Omar Little for homosexuality while accepting their unquestioned physical dominance. Able to live in a double-think world where a gay man is simultaneously weak but strong enough to jack your shit up. Anyway, I think it's handled really deliberately here, and it speaks subtly to those issues. Ziggy Sabaka is played by James Ransone. He's a perpetual f**k-up and all-around asshole. He's loved by his friends and family, but he goes through life with a constant desire to be the man, and his arc leaves him consumed by those desires in a tragic way. Through his attempts to succeed in life, he's constantly seeking attention and approval by any means, even if that means is the butt of a joke. Sadly, without reflection, he's swallowed up by the pain of that yearning for acceptance and respect. Here we broaden the scope of the series again by the introduction of European Connections, an organization that dwarfs our previous scope, people who traffic in drugs by the ton and women in shipping cans. Characters like the Greek, played by Bill Raymond, is the head of an international criminal organization involved in narcotics and human trafficking. Built up as a mysterious figure involved in numerous criminal activities, he appears to have ties to the federal government as an informant on terrorist activities all around the world. By leveraging this knowledge, he's shielded from law enforcement and essentially sanctioned to continue his activities. His presence in the story serves to highlight the nefarious quid pro quo that allows worldwide systems of abuse to flourish even in local areas. There's Spiros Vondas, played by Paul Ben Victor. He helps run the local connections of the Greek's criminal organization. He's the face that allows the Greek to stay in the shadows. Knowledgeable and cunning, he deftly navigates professional relationships, allowing him to dangle necessary bait to keep conscientious participants like Frank right on the line. His relationship to Prop Joe also serves as another connection between the docks and the east side via the same drug connect. A perfect example of a city being fleshed out in a way that deepens the connection between its disparate parts instead of thinning them out. Finally, we have Sergei Boris Molotov, played by Chris Ashworth. Why am I Boris? I don't understand this. Everywhere I am Boris. He plays muscle and flex. On hand for the driving involved in smuggling off the cans, he gives off the distinct impression that if something heavy was going to go down, he'd probably be there too. Eventually, he takes the fall, as we see so many soldiers do in The Wire, shielding those further up the ladder from consequences. Alright, you can see how difficult it is to get these sections out of the way with main players in a story like this. Season 2 kicks off with a quick catch-up to those old characters and an introduction to these new ones. There's really two inciting incidents for the season as two separate plots careen towards each other over the course of its run. On one hand, we have a full-blown investigation started by Frank Sabatka due to Stan Valchek's ego and an argument over a window. Not a joke, and I won't explain any further. On the other hand, we have a dead girl in the water and 13 in a can on the docks. McNulty, who never tires of getting into other people's shit, puts in the investigative work to turn all 14 deaths ruled natural into murders, and to spite him back, those 14 murders are assigned to his friends, Bunk and Lester. What'd he call call? Collateral damage. I'm feeling pretty damn collateral myself, I gotta say. Finally, we follow Stringer Bell as he takes over the day-to-day -day running of the Barksdale organization, wanting to transform it into a business and move past the quote, old gangster shit. As we follow multiple parties, the show is taking great care to build that anticipation for the eventual union we can feel on the horizon. McNulty especially feels lost in the water, Very nice. only able to pick up scraps from the outside, his ego once again getting on his boss's nerves. Bit by bit, we see the parallels between the people on the streets of inner city Baltimore and the workers on the docks. The struggles they each face to work within a system that seems intent on making life well, impossible. That leaves both longshoremen's and corner boys mercy to the whims of institutions that control their lives and livelihoods, you know, because of the capitalism.
In season two, we explore how gentrification works in subtle but personal ways by renaming the neighborhoods the characters grew up in, like Locust Point, to Federal Hill just to attract better buyers, which locks out locals. Say Federal Hill. Excuse me? This is the point. Locust Point. As far as real estate goes, anything that is below Montgomery Street and above the water is now called Federal Hill. In what is sadly, though, one of the few looks into our prison system, we move over to D'Angelo, Barksdale, and Avon as they process imprisonment in their own ways. Avon's mentality is that you only do two days, but this is pushed back by D'Angelo as naive. He knows that, as a repeat offender, he'll be there for 10 years no matter what happens. D'Angelo's journey of self-reflection pushes him away from his uncle and the Barksdale organization, but in a bid to remove a potential betrayal, Stringer Bell has D'Angelo hit in jail, staging it as a suicide to avoid the heat that'll come back on him. D'Angelo's death, similar to Wallace's, was a poignant reminder that anyone in this story is vulnerable and anyone can die. When D'Angelo Barksdale went down, he was like one of the most, he was, he was a lot of people's favorite character on that show. I thought, if they can kill him, they can kill anybody. D'Angelo, with all his growth and obvious regrets, was a beloved character, making his death all the more impactful. Slowly in the police's investigation, the team is coming back together, and with Kima breaking her girl's promise and Daniels taking on the 14 murders, there's a hilarious scene that, in no uncertain terms and with no words necessary, tells us they both done f***ed up in their home lives. BD gets coached up on the recurring importance of a good CI, and like clockwork, this ends up giving them an avenue with which to track cans that go missing off the dock. Headed back into the city, we get one of Omar's most memorable moments, his turn on the witness stand in the trial resulting from season one's investigation. Off the bat, showing his intelligence, he helps a cop through a word puzzle using his knowledge of mythology and then goes on to completely dominate his time on the stand. Part of what makes the scene so excellent is how it provides commentary on the similarities between Omar's position on the streets and lawyer Maurice Levy, played by Michael Kostroff. Providing a juxtaposition between those two, seemingly miles apart, Omar cuts to the heart of it. You're feeding off the violence and the despair of the drug trade. You're stealing from those who themselves are stealing the lifeblood from our city. You are a parasite who leeches off Just like you, the culture man. of drugs. Excuse me? What? I got the shotgun. You got the briefcase. It's on the game, though, right? In one subtle but important scene, the investigation is over before we know it. FBI agent Fitzhugh rings up Agent Kutris, an agent who's connected to their target, the Greek, through a prior investigation, unknowingly giving them a heads up that they're on their trail. With their connection functioning as a handler and CI, Agent Kutris works to keep the Greek informed and out of prison to collect information on counterterrorism efforts. Watching it slowly unfold over the season, we're left to wonder if this is actually legal or if Kutris is dirty, and I definitely think that's the point. In the end of the season, the episode is aptly titled Storm Warnings. Tension that's been building up on many fronts comes to a head. Avon hires the hard-hitting and mysterious brother Muzone, played by Michael Potts, who comes in to secure his territory, ruining the secretive deal Stringer made with Prop Joe. Not to mention, he shoots Method Man. We gotta save that guy. In a final bid to get Brother Muzone out of his hair, Stringer manipulates Omar into killing Brother as revenge for Brandon. But at the last moment, Omar realizes Brother wasn't responsible, setting up an inevitable confrontation. In one of the most depressing endings of The Wire, we close several loops. Frank is murdered as a result of turning state's witness. Nick is put into witness protection. Ziggy is in jail for shooting one of the Greeks, and the docks are being turned into luxury apartments. The Greek escapes arrest. The feds even get to dismantle a union, so truly a gold star day for them. And while Daniels and the team close the book on their 14 murders, in a tragic final outro, we see that the drug trade continues without delay. The Greek simply finds a new avenue with which to move the drugs, women, and more into the country. The ending shot of Nick Sabatka staring through the metal fence at his broken life. The framing leaves him trapped behind the fence like a prisoner in a cage. Sending haunts me every time. The scene just ties together the season as a necessary piece of The Wire's entire message. That these corrupt institutions are both pervasive and unaffected by the current approach to policing and legislation. 
Critical reception of the second season of The Wire was mixed at the time due to the new plot deviating so heavily from its season 1 setting and characters, though now the season is viewed fairly favorably as a linchpin linking many of the parts of the city together in a way that adds depth to the struggle of surviving in a system where people you may never know of with complete immunity will control your very livelihood, even if that livelihood is on a corner or on a dock. Through two seasons, the show has portrayed various aspects of our judicial system and the broader cultural systems at play within Baltimore. But The Wire, while definitely taking a position in many ways, whether it's by acknowledging the inefficiency of the police or bluntly portraying the failures of a power structure that is self-serving and corrupt, it hasn't yet offered up its own solution. This changes in season three. Widely considered one of the best in television history, season three would seek to build off the threads and characters laid down previously, and by returning to the inner city, it truly begins to create the holistic story that earns it so much praise. In the third season, the focus returns to the street and the Barksdale organization. The Wire would expand the scope to include the city's political scene, with new characters like Mayor Clarence Royce, played by Glenn Turman, who is beholden to the whims of those who keep him in power. Mayor Royce cares greatly about those who fund his campaign as he seeks re-election, and quick to protect developers who contribute heavily to his office. In turn, Royce ensures that their permits go through while blocking those that don't serve him financially. The granary in Season 2, which the dock union members were fighting to keep open, is an example. Tommy Carchetti, played by the uber-talented Aidan Gillen. Carchetti is an ambitious and idealistic Baltimore politician with a penchant for adultery who begins the series with a seat on the city council, but through manipulation and the slow stripping away of his ideals, becomes functionally indifferent from Clarence Royce or Clay Davis, with what he lacks in greed for money he makes up for in a thirst for power. He manipulates his friend on the council to run against the mayor, and he uses Commissioner Burrell to give him dirt on the mayor, and ultimately, when in power, he chooses to maintain his political capital at the expense of school and police funding the former being significantly more important than the latter. Many saw the connection between Carchetti and real-life Baltimore mayor Martin O'Malley, an Irish-American city councilor who was elected mayor, defeating two black opponents. Finally, there's recurring fan favorite, the always hilarious and sometimes infuriating, Senator Clay Davis, played by Isaiah Whitlock Jr., famous for saying this she. The mannerism originated with Whitlock's uncle, from whom Whitlock picked up the habit. Spike Lee even encouraged him to use it during his role on Black Klansman. She... In an essay in the official series guide, The Wire, Truth Be Told, series writer William Zorzi implies that Davis is patterned on former Maryland State Senator Larry Young. Clay Davis is slowly built up through interactions in season 1 and 2, moments that show him tangentially related to the Barksdale organization and the docks as a money man. As far as the federal money is concerned, he's everything. The faucet, the goose. The oh, goose. The one that lays them golden eggs. <laughs> Viewers will come to know him as a snake before he wraps himself around an unwitting Stringer Bell to squeeze him for everything he's got. Through the introduction of new characters in the police department, the writers would take a stance on the war on drugs, and their position is explored via the potential positive effects of legalizing the drug trade and tangentially sex work within the boundaries of a few uninhabited city blocks. We meet Howard Bunny Colvin, played by actor Robert Wisdom. Colvin is a wise but weary major in Baltimore's Western District, alienated by the careerism and indifference inherent to the bureaucracy of the Baltimore's police department along with the detrimental social effects of the war on drugs. With retirement coming up, he secretly puts his resources into Hamsterdam, three zones in his district where drug dealers and users can sell and buy as long as there is no violence, freeing his police officers to follow more substantive cases than minor drug offenses. Benefits proposed here, as in Amsterdam and other European cities, are reduced street crime citywide, and increased outreach of health and social services to vulnerable people. And while this does lead to clean corners in his district, without any city assistance or health services as a follow-through, it quickly develops into a hellish mound just pushed under a rug. Finally, we meet the young lion hunting for the crown of Baltimore's drug trade, 
Marlo Stanfield, played by Jamie Hector, the leader of a growing West Baltimore crew. In contrast to Season 2, many of Season 3's characters would become the mainstays for the remainder of the series. Season 3 would start with some big brain symbolism. We open with the towers as the community watches them be destroyed for new development. In a proposed effort to improve the city, tearing down the towers literally represents a walking back of previous promises. How the failure or lack of a desire to plan ahead and provide proper support led to improper policing and redistricting, which led to the very formation of the projects. While initially touted as a way to provide low-income housing to many, it was a veil for the true intent to stifle entire communities and deny them opportunities to succeed. Through concerted efforts to deny housing loans to black families and the redistricting of political lines to the detriment of community power, generations were pushed into city housing which was then neglected by the powers that control the police and the development of new city resources. Those projects are then used as scapegoats for capitalist endeavors with the same people who put them up in the first place leveraging their destruction and rebirth as a simple means of attaining political capital. And you know, capital capital. Bodhi cuts to the heart of its impact on the community. They are all moved to new housing, no better in quality than their current standards, and meanwhile, the city takes the cake. You live in the projects, you ain't shit, but you slaying product there? You got the game by the ass, man. Shit. And now these downtown suit wearing ass bitches done snatched up the best territory in the city from y'all. The demolition of the residential towers that had served as the Barksdale organization's prime territory pushed their dealers back out into the streets of Baltimore. Secretly, Stringer Bell continues changing the organization by working with other drug lords and sharing territory, product, and profits. Newly introduced Marlo Stanfield, the leader of the growing crew in the area, rejects the offer. Every scene with him denotes his self-control and unwillingness to bend to other people's demands. Confident in his muscle and intuition, subtly we also see his single-minded focus on his quest for the top crown. He immerses himself in interactions with older mentors, choosing to stay true to the old ways of the game, putting him ideologically at odds with Stringer and Prop Joe, but surprisingly, in line with Avon. Against Stringer's advice, Avon decides to take Marlowe's territory by force, and the two gangs become embroiled in a bitter turf war with multiple deaths. Omar Little continues to rip and rob the Barksdales at every opportunity, and this leads to them running a war on two fronts. Councilman Tommy Carchetti himself, on the other side of the game, is preparing for a mayoral race by manipulating his colleagues into running against the mayor to split the black vote, manipulating Commissioner Burrell into providing compromising information on the mayor, which sours his relationship in the process, and finally, he betrays the good faith discussions that he has with Bunny Colvin regarding Hamsterdam, exposing it, using it as a springboard for his entry into the city's mayoral race. Hitting the end of his career, Major Howard Bunny Colvin sets up the areas in the Western District where the police could monitor but not punish the drug trade. The police would crack down severely on violence in these areas and also on drug trafficking elsewhere in the city, and while this works for a time, he's forced to acknowledge by both personal confidants like the Deacon and professional colleagues like his own men in McNulty that they all state with various degrees of confidence that the endeavor will fail because ultimately, without public support or private sector support, the game will go right back to the corners, and the people who come to Amsterdam will die in a hellish state of abandonment. People are dying on their feet. The other half's gonna catch what's killing them. Look, they ain't no worse off than when it was all over the map. Now they're just in one place is all. And that place is hell. But by taking the teeth out of the game, you can reach people. And with public support, you could perform vital public health services that treat the most vulnerable players in the drug trade. The addicted, who are nonetheless viewed as complicit in today's society. Just can't see it. See what? A great village of pain and you're the mayor. Where's your drinking water? Where's your toilets, your heat, your electricity? The current approach to clearing corners is at best hopeless and at worst an active mismanagement of time and resources that function merely as stat games. In the end, the current approach will never lead to long-term success or best put by the deacon. That's a force of nature. That's sweeping leaves on a windy day, whoever the hell you are. It's here where the wire levies its most firm position. The show's view on the war on drugs has been fairly nuanced to this point, allowing us to view each stage of the process 
and the various tendrils that feed outward. Here, though, the writers convey a potential approach to managing the issue. Public health services, decriminalization of users, needle exchanges, condom distribution, and this frees up investigators to pursue community policing investigations and major violent crimes, even theft, which if anyone out there has ever had to file a police report for a theft, you know how hilarious it is, the idea that the police would not only help you, but actually catch the person responsible. So ultimately, Colvin is forced to cease his actions, accept a demotion, and retire from the police department in shame on a lower grade pension. His men were split on the decision from the beginning, with most supporting him out of pure respect and not support for the initiative itself. Though, through his process, we see genuine growth in Carver, who is forced to acknowledge that his own approach to policing has been woefully inept, and that only through building community connections and knowledge can he truly become the ideal that he strives to be. In one of my favorite multi-season strands, this is the first strand type show, Dennis Cuddy Wise, played by Chad L. Coleman. Great name, Dennis. Once Avon's Enforcer is our first real look at the concept of recidivism for newly released convicts, and while some of it speaks truth to the real-world situations, his story path is rife with an almost miraculous set of circumstances which need to occur for him to have an earnest second chance. In one of our country's greatest failures, the United States is one of the highest rates of recidivism in the whole world. According to the National Institute of Justice, almost 44% of criminals released return before the first year out of prison, Maryland scoring just below that average. And this is also not a bug, but a feature of the current criminal justice system. Though prison and the criminal justice system are culturally broadly portrayed as a way to hold people accountable for crimes, they're also limply held up as a rehabilitative system which helps people reintegrate into society once they've paid their dues, despite focusing none of its energy or resources to those efforts. In a system that focuses on punishment and not rehabilitation, it's no coincidence that the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration by a wide margin, with a disproportionate number of arrests, convictions, and unequal sentencing across class and even more finely, racial lines. And we don't even actually have time to discuss how the 13th Amendment codifies slavery of prisoners to this day, leading to what I can only describe as painfully f***ed up uses of real lives in modern times. Those released from prison are, by all accounts, supposed to have served their time and been deemed ready to re-enter society. However, we live in a world that essentially bars them from proper reintegration, and then penalizes and vilifies them for having completed their punishment. They have more difficulty in obtaining employment, and throw, we see Cuddy with the general indifference to his attempt to find a job, being told- They're still doing morning shape-ups down at the market. I don't know and I don't care. Just get a job, any job. They're barred from voting, which automatically removes them from the communal process of affecting their own lives. No, thank you, man. I can't vote. Did you? Tell him, move on, man. And these are just some of the legal means which push people back into the criminal activities following release, completely ignoring the social ostracization that occurs. Cuddy tries to work as a manual laborer, but struggles to adapt to the life as a free man, briefly going to work for Avon due to money concerns and a lack of direction after serving more than a decade behind bars. He realizes that he's no longer fit for the game, he doesn't have the heart for murder and quits the crew. Only through the miraculous kindness of several people with not just the compassion but the connections and authority to help him, does Cuddy become Dennis and escape the game. Deacon takes an interest in him, helping him connect with a local delegate who gets him necessary permits to open a new boxing gym in his community, and additionally, he's given a free $15,000 loan from Avon Barksdale to get new equipment for his fledgling gym. Ultimately, Dennis becomes a mainstay for the remainder of the show, using his gym as a way to help improve the lives of young men without direction in his community. This idyllic path is, in my opinion, both awesome and tragic. It stands as a reminder of all the things that go against someone, even with an earnest desire to escape the game. They're fighting an uphill battle. And that's one of my two largest complaints for The Wire. It's, 
its shy reflection on the inextricably tied issues helping to ensure the war on drug remains cyclic and unending. Part 2 comes later, so stick around for it. While this is going on, Stringer has been buying real estate and developing it to fulfill his dream of going legit, becoming a bank for the organization. Believing that the war with Marlowe is set to destroy everything the Barksdales had worked for, Stringer gives information to Major Colvin on Avon's weapon stash, but well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of his actions. Brother Muzone returns to Baltimore and tracks down Omar to join forces. Avon, recalling how Stringer betrayed his orders and tried to hit Muzone, furious over D'Angelo's murder to which Stringer had confessed, and fearing Muzone's ability to harm his reputation outside of Baltimore, Avon gives up Stringer and Muzone with Omar, cornering and shooting him to death mere moments before McNulty and the major crime unit would get the necessary evidence to put him away. Well, get on with it, motherfucker. Colvin tells McNulty about Avon's hideout and, armed with the information gleaned from selling the Barksdale crew pre-wiretapped disposable cell phones, holy shit, big yikes on that sanctioned activity, uh, the details stages a raid, arresting Avon and most of his crew, knowing that the crew will go down for it. Their empire lies in ruins, Marlowe wins by default and moves into their territory as the drug trade in the West Baltimore area continues. Quick sidebar, Detective Ray Cole dies this season and it seems to f*** up McNulty in a really deep emotional way. It leads to him reconsidering his current path, which I didn't understand at first, but it turns out that Ray Cole is Robert Coleman, the show's executive producer and director of the season 2 finale, one of my personal favorites. Sadly, he died as a result of heart surgery complications and he's honored on the show. Many cite him as a core reason for the show's early success and realistic portrayals, so this felt like an uncharacteristically emotional thread and it makes more sense in hindsight. Season 3 would go on to achieve one of the highest ratings of any season on television and high critical praise across the board. Despite all this though, The Wire was allegedly close to cancellation. It isn't hard to believe though, The Sopranos was completing its run and the writers have since lamented the awful situation of being held up to that standard of financial success. Thankfully, the show would continue and with the entire group of actors also allegedly taking either pay cuts or not raising their rates in order to make the production possible. Season 4 is frequently mentioned in conversation with Season 3 as the top tier and for good reason. The cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. The show sets you up with three seasons of this is the world of poverty, drug dealing, and the cops in Baltimore, and then Season 4 hits you with, now let's watch how this system of indifference and abuse just f***s up innocent children. When the thunder rolls, but you gotta keep the devil where season one is all about street level drug dealing, season two is about the ports and how they're tied to the inner city game, season three introduces political institutions that stifle some programs and use others as tools for political leverage or financial gain, season four focuses on the school system and is the perfect, tragic recontextualization of all of this buildup. It functions as an examination of how the Bubbles, the Omars, and the Avons of this world are created. This is the show's second firm stance, a true position without ambiguity. The schools are failed by the systems in control. Programs aren't funded which seek to address the needs of children at the edge of the game. Not high school or adult life, but the young ones where the decisions are still being formed in their mind. When forced into a no child left behind framework, Bunny quotes, These would be the children left behind, so to speak. But as it is, I mean, we're, we're leaving them all behind anyway. We just don't want to admit it. <laughs> what we, what we need Kids are pushing back against teachers who can't teach them what they need to use to survive on the streets. And when they meet on their level, they're finally engaged. But the ones in charge don't see socialization as education, leading to children who neither socialize nor educate learning outside of the frameworks of their own community. And ultimately, they don't engage in new ways of navigating their community. Much of this season is viewed through the lens of Prez as he transitions from police to teacher, a similar journey to co-creator Ed Burns, and this follows the lives of Dookie, Randy, Michael, and Naaman, four boys from West Baltimore as they enter the 8th grade, many of whom have character parallels and adult connections that inform their paths. 
One funny one is Clay Davis and Naaman Bryce. Shit, I'll take any motherfucking money if he giving it away now. <laughs> take any motherfucker's money if he giving it away. On a more serious note is Bubbles to Dookie, showing how failures in family care and resources, along with school's lack of funding for both social work and personal investment in students, leads to them pushing homeless kids out and up into grades or situations they aren't prepared for. How addiction can be a seed that takes root given the proper environment, be it pushed into the streets with no system of support, a lack of options for rising up or out of those circumstances. Or there's similarities between Randy and Wallace, witnesses to and unwilling players in murders which leave lasting effects on them both individually and with greater interactions in their community. Of the four boys, there's Naaman Bryce played by Julito McCollum, the son of Weebay, a longtime fan favorite Barksdale enforcer. He's set up as a rich, entitled, and fake member of the group. Unaware of his fortune, he frequently dogs on Dookie as a way of shielding himself from feelings of inadequacy. Man, I said you's a gump. Fucking dog shit and smelling that. His path is subtly tragic, though similarly to Dennis, he also represents an idyllic, almost miraculous escape from his circumstances. His mother, despite raising him with all the toys and clothes a young man could want, is also emotionally abusive, wielding her petty narcissism like a blunt tool and conditioning Naaman with her attitudes of disgust towards the poor and unfortunate. He's pushed to work corners after his mother blows through their money, and despite his pedigree, he's not built for the game. Through a natural class clown mentality, and through the school program for the corner kids, his ego and posturing is broken down by Bunny Colvin, now working with the University of Maryland's social program studies. Finally being met at a neutral ground and being seen for the skills he truly has, he's able to find a way out of the game as the less fortunate around him fall deeper into its clutches. Duquan Dookie Weems, played by Jermaine Crawford, whom I mentioned about four years ago in my introduction, is truly one of the saddest tales you can follow in the show. It's a true indictment of the status quo. Bars. Living in complete poverty with a family that is addicted to drugs and frequently steals his food and clothing to sell for more, Dookie is emotionally abused by his own circle of friends at times for his smell, appearance, or even the innocuous choices of food that speak to his perceived status within the community, like ordering traditional drunkard food after unknowingly learning them from his family. This nigga ordered turkey grease. <laughs> Wrong, y'all. I mean, my mom, she get it all the time. Yo, you was really one of them at-risk children. Yo, you know that, Ultimately, he grows close to Prez, but that can't save Dookie from the drug world's wide-reaching grasp. His intelligence, curiosity, and kindness is eventually swallowed up by the streets, leaving viewers with nothing but the hope that he may find his way back out of the darkness someday and with little faith in it occurring. Randy Wagstaff, played by Maestro Harrell, whose low-key connection to Prop Joe extends beyond his entrepreneurial nature via a familial connection to potential father, Cheese Wagstaff. My own headcanon, anyway. Randy, Herc, and Carver become tied in an intrinsic way this season, expertly highlighting the numerous police and policy failures in an intersectional way. Herc uses police cameras without proper authority, losing it to Marlowe and starting the clock on his problems. Herc neglects both Bubbles and Randy in his quest to solve his own personal problem, which results in Bubbles' tragic turn to a last resort, and Randy's connection to an ongoing investigation being revealed, which causes his foster mother to be assaulted in his own home and him sent to a group home. Herc gets fired eventually, leaving all of these consequences in his wake and nothing to show for it. Herc then lands with a criminal, criminal lawyer, Levy, and is able to get the cell number that eventually nails Marlowe, but in one final on-brand twist, he provides Levy with information that directly results in Marlowe being freed in the end. Carver, whose transformative journey has led him to this point, he finally understands that all the pieces matter. I never told you, Herc. Never said a fucking word. I gave you that kid to debrief last year, and what's his face? Yeah, I fucked up. So what? So it mattered. Randy is Carver's personal failure, whose words in the hospital inform his worldview moving forward. You gonna look out for me, Sergeant Carver? You mean it? You gonna look out for me? 
You got my back, huh? Michael Lee, played by Tristan Wilds, is a smart kid and a loyal friend who also lives in a household with a drug-addicted mother who sells his food, leading to him growing up early as the head of household. We see that the specter of abuse hangs over him when his brother's father is released from jail. The implication of his former abuse is clear in interactions with men he perceives as too friendly. This reaction, combined with his perceptive nature of the rules of the game, leads to his aggressive descent into violence after getting involved with Marlowe's crew. His path is, in the end, a mirror to Omar, showing a keen awareness and sense of conscience, which questions the mindless violence of the game and its necessity, choosing in the end to enact that violence against the game's worst aggressors, still a cold-blooded killer, but generating a code of his own. His name is Vincent. Used to be Marlowe's bank. It's a Barksdale joint, man. Do tell. So, I'm thinking some of that money need to be mine. So what up, man? You don't value my time. Bars. This season also takes a closer look at Marlo Stanfield's drug gang, which has grown to control most of Western Baltimore's trafficking, using murder and intimidation to make up for his weak drugs and lack of business acumen. His enforcers conceal their victims in abandoned and row homes where their bodies will not be quickly discovered. McNulty is essentially retired, choosing to work as a patrolman while maintaining a for once healthy lifestyle, consistently sober, and surprisingly steady relationship with his kids and Beatty. And through the season, we see more distinct and purposeful parallels between the police and the school system. Scenes which show them inundated with often irrelevant training which doesn't speak to their day-to-day -day struggles or concerns, along with a general lack of funding where it matters, though, again, I'd say with schools, it's significantly more important. Colvin's special class program begins to make demonstrable progress as students are given a chance to talk about their ambitions and views on what makes a successful corner boy also relaying something of a motive for their disruptive behavior when discussing examples of others profiting from wrongdoing. The season is bleak in many ways. Tommy Carchetti wins his election against Mayor Royce, but we see the numerous manipulations at play that imply the slow chipping away of his idealistic nature. He chooses to forsake the schools and police in one fell swoop by refusing $54 million in school aid because it would wound him politically. Both, once again, used as pawns regardless of the political powers in charge. Prez has a few successes within his students, but some of them start to slip away. Randy, in a moment of desperation, reveals knowledge of a murder to the assistant principal, leading to his being interrogated by police. Dukey's moved up to high school, losing his access to clean water and clothes supplied by Prez, and falls into the game, working a corner for Michael. And when Bubbles takes Sherrod, a homeless teenager under his wing, he fails in his attempts to encourage the boy to return to school, and though through repeated local abuse, he's pushed to commit murder to defend himself, tragically killing his mentee by accident. We watch as Bubbles hits rock bottom, alive only in body, and wishing that weren't even the case. Omar brings the fight to Marlowe as Prop Joe manipulates them into a conflict to his own ends. In the end, this results in the co-op losing their entire shipment to Omar, Marlowe getting a lead on the Greek, and finally, we see on Freeman and Bunk's end that they discover Marlowe's missing bodies, laid to rest in row homes and sealed like modern mausoleums, but through more political machinations, they're forced to sit on the info and let the case grow cold. A stark reminder that even dozens of bodies won't rate if it doesn't serve the political institutions in control. In the season's final scene, the usual bittersweet or bleak ending is eschewed by a quiet escape to Naaman's new home. Now adopted by Colvin, he's escaped the system his friends have been consumed by. His new home is filled with love, respect, and the sounds of wind chimes and nature help punctuate how this is almost a fantasy ending that we would do well to view as barely plausible. Without season 4, the context originally laid down in season 2 showing the drug, police, and political institutions far-reaching power would have been incomplete. Here in season 4, all of those institutions form a Venn diagram that looks more like a circle, and we fully grasp the insidious effects of that overlaying mess of power and indifference. All the pieces matter. 
headed into season five, fans, cast, and even HBO producers' spirits were pretty high. The Wire was more popular than ever, and its critical reception peaked, despite Ebby snubs continuing. The final season would wrap up all the remaining storylines it could in part via the Baltimore Sun, writer David Simon's former employer. If any season of The Wire drew lasting criticism, it would be here in the end. The finishing with higher ratings than season 1, season 5 is widely viewed as the weakest season as it seemed to disregard the nuanced approach and tight narrative of prior seasons in service of clear-cut villains and just wild fake killer plots that strain believability on many fronts. Despite this, it also holds some of the show's more memorable scenes, including tragic sudden deaths as well as satisfying conclusion to several character arcs in a way that leaves the viewer with the understanding that life for these characters in this city will go on beyond the confines of this narrative. Save your soul. We quickly meet a few people at the Baltimore Sun. Two main characters are relevant to the season's primary plots. Augustus Gus Haynes, played by Clark Johnson, who was also a director for the series. Gus is the dedicated and principled editor for the Baltimore City Sun Desk, who frequently butts heads with his superiors and shows open disdain for reporters he feels sensationalize the news for their own gain. While profane and blunt, he's also a true leader, quick to compliment and criticize his team where appropriate, and putting himself on the line for his team and their beliefs. His nature and position naturally see him bump up against Scott Templeton, played by Tom McCarthy, a young reporter whose extreme ambition leads him to falsify stories for his own advancement. Seeing the Baltimore Sun is merely a stepping stone on his ascendance to a real news town. His prose is reflective of his personality and is often overwrought and exaggerated. <laughs> While it is welcomed by his higher-ups for the eyes they bring to the paper, Gus has a fundamental problem with it, seeing the compromises needed to prop up stories that are potentially damaging to their credibility and standards. The Sun is routinely held up as another parallel to the police department and political institutions through the mirroring of situations and circumstance. Lack of funding and self-serving higher-ups, once again seeking awards and approval by juking the stats, whether it's by dropping important stories because they won't win a Pulitzer, or withholding promised resources on 20-plus murder investigations to shore up school funding problems for political capital. Johnny can't write because Johnny doesn't have a fucking pencil. We follow Omar now as he goes to war against Marlowe, coming out of retirement of his own. He seeks retribution for Marlowe's murder of his friend and confidant. Showing his intelligence and cunning, he routinely gets the drop on Marlowe's people, dispatching several in his quest for information. His methods are highly tuned to Marlowe's specific weakness, his keen awareness of the game and the power of a name. Bars. When knowledge of Omar publicly calling him out comes to light, Marlowe is forced to react, and in one of the more memorable scenes, Jamie Hector delivers a killer performance, guided in part by this conversation with producer Nina Noble. This scene, when we all got locked up, I'll never forget Nina, before we shot the scene, Nina K. Noble, one of the producers on the show, pulled me over and said, um, look at this as if it's corporate America, if you want to and realize that IBM or Goldman Sachs can't afford for their name to be slandered. And then I remember also my mother used to always tell me, like, your name is everything. Let them know Marlo step to any motherfucker, Omar, Barksdale, whoever. My name is my name. Eventually, viewers would be stunned at the sudden end to their conflict. Omar, now hobbled and alone in his hunt for Marlo, comes off as a shell of his former self to the young hoppers, where his legend used to strike them with awe. Omar's, Omar, yo. That's Omar? Dang. Now they're deep into the game and blunted by the violence, and in a scene dripping with brutal finality, Omar is shot from behind by a child, taken from us very suddenly. Sidebar, I, I just want to say that his death in 2021 felt similarly sudden, and upon this rewatch, it hit me quite hard. In a time where the world is battling a global pandemic, Michael K. Williams, like so many, was battling his own addiction. Taken by the continued expansion of the opioid epidemic, which saw an intense resurgence with the rise in fentanyl. I can only offer my sincere hope that this issue, which affects so many people in our country and beyond, is given the necessary resources and attention it deserves.
Marlowe's only opposition unknowingly becomes Lester Freeman, and through an illegal wiretap and McNulty's insane shenanigans, their paths come to a head in a way that feels true to The Wire's bleak view on the failings of the judicial and political approach inherent to the current police system. So about McNulty's shenanigans. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. I want to talk about the Fonz. Hey. Arthur Fonzarelli of Happy Days is an iconic figure in your parents' or your grandparents' lives, and while many newer generations may only know of him or this show through the cultural osmosis, two of its lasting effects have been, sometimes when you smack a oven, it'll just work again and you'll feel the goodness of that in your bones, you god of tech you. The second, though, is the most observable rule of sitcoms or long-running media. That you either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself jump the shark. For many, season 5 of The Wire officially jumps the shark. McNulty comes out of retirement at the end of season four being promised the resources to pursue real high-level work and attack larger pieces of the drug and violence in Baltimore, and this feeds his ego like an addict getting a fix. And when that funding is inevitably withheld, he goes off the deep end in a way that we've never seen before. He fabricates evidence of a serial killer going as far to manufacture the evidence and manipulate fresh corpses in order to get funds diverted to the now stripped down major crimes unit. Bunk is immediately appalled and thinks Lester will talk some sense into him, but miscalculates. Finally having enough of the indifference himself, Lester helps McNulty raise the stakes to close out his investigation into Marlowe with funding he uses to run the illegal wiretap. Connecting with the Sun, our shady reporter Scott Templeton fabricates a call and McNulty piles on to lend further legitimacy to the case. And with the pressure and consequences mounting, McNulty finally tells Kima about his lies to prevent her from wasting time on the case. Greggs tells Daniels, who along with Rhonda Perlman takes the news to the mayor, who orders a cover-up because it's going to damage his campaign, which is kind of hinging on this. Gus simultaneously brings forth evidence of Scott's lies to his bosses, but they silence him in favor of their potential award-winning writer. And in a final montage, McNulty gazes over the city, forced out of the police. Freeman enjoys retirement. Templeton wins a Pulitzer. Carchetti becomes governor, appointing ladder-climbing Rawls as superintendent of the Maryland police. Gus gets sidelined to a copy desk, and Dookie continues to use heroin, lost to the game. Perlman becomes a judge and Daniels a defense attorney, resigning from his short stint as commissioner due to his unwillingness to fabricate stats for Carchetti. Bubbles, through a season-long redemption, is allowed back into his sister's home where he enjoys a family dinner. Marlowe escapes prosecution being advised to give up the crown but is unable to pull himself away from the game, and the drug trade continues. And with the people of Baltimore going on with their lives, the story comes to a close. I, I think that's it, basically. I don't, I don't know that there's anything else I want to talk about. Oh, wait. Is this propaganda? Is the wire copaganda? No doubt. But it's probably the most nuanced one you can watch, showing the police in a fairly negative to neutral light and providing both systemic context and adaptations of real world abuses of power and control. But it's impossible to escape the undeniable fact that it is inherently pro police. Our central characters, the few we can reasonably call protagonists, are staunchly confident that if only the individual bosses within the department were replaced with real police, they would solve real casework. Squad guys do love to break out their toys, don't they? Do you think it's Tony Montana up there? These guys probably haven't touched a gun in years. Ah, oh, fuck this shit. You and me, Lieutenant. If half of you had the fucking balls to follow through, you know what would happen? Uh. A guy like that would be indicted, tried, and convicted, and the rest of them would back up enough so we could push a clean case or two through your courthouse. But Paying no, minor lip service to the idea that systemic training and political pressure to juke stats has generated a whole mass of police who can't tackle substantial work, they frequently hold the position that it is individuals and not a complete systemic hierarchy that leads to bad policing. If only the judges would stop taking handouts and the politicians stop pressing pockets, good police could do good police work. 
and therein lies the core phrase that signals its ultimate belief in the system. Despite its well-documented failures and fairly nuanced portrayal of them here, natural police or good police is thrown around quite frequently within the show. It makes him an asshole, I know, but it's also what makes him good police. Christ, you sick fuck. Oh. But what makes good police? Can there even be good police? And finally, are the traits that make someone good police the same or parallel to what makes a good soldier? Eyes open, keeping the count, soft eyes, you have to know where you are at all times, you have to posture. One voice, yo, one voice. Yo, yo, D, you tell them. Stay always people watching. Watching? You. Yeah. Ultimately, viewers are left with the final position that McNulty is good police a complex and deeply flawed man who abuses his power for his perceived sense of justice, who drinks and deceives and is in the end shielded from the ultimate consequences of his actions by a state-sanctioned cover-up, willing to push judges to pursue cases he once solved or to become fake serial killers to get claims funded. The show's so close by its willingness to portray the police as composed of deeply flawed individuals and as an institution beholden to the abusive structures of control, but it can't escape the pervasive portrayal of cops being the ultimate bastions of justice, simply held down by mismanagement and bureaucracy. I hope that, despite these criticisms, my love for the show shines through. As someone said, it's both possible and even necessary to simultaneously enjoy media while also being critical of its more problematic or pernicious aspects. The Wire is a great example that perfect media doesn't exist, but it can be pretty damn close. Thanks for watching. Whew, all right. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, you know, I really appreciate you just getting to this point. Uh, it means a lot. I worked really hard on this. I promise I read every comment. I love to engage with people in the chat. You'd be doing me a huge favor by sharing it around if you think people will be interested. I have a new Patreon and uh, PayPal in the description below if anyone feels like contributing to the channel. Um, say hi to my dogs while you're here and uh, all of my guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Please be safe.